All right. Well, I don't think Nancy needs any introduction. And I'm, I'm going to abbreviate the title as it's put on the uh, uh, agenda here. What are NI Software R&D engineers developing? So hopefully we get some insights. All right. Um, so that was actually humorous that I couldn't, I didn't realize, oh, I, I need to plug in the HDMI cable. I was uh, telling Bill just a second ago that um, my husband reminds me regularly that I was born blonde and now I dye my hair brown. <laughs> so uh, sometimes I miss the obvious and Bill just told me a wonderful joke. Um, what do you call someone who is blonde and she dyes her hair brown? Artificially intelligent. <laughs> All right, so uh, what the heck, what the hell, whatever, what are NI software R&D uh, engineers doing? What are, they, uh, what, are we, what are they developing? I'm not in R&D. And then the bigger picture as well is how does LabVIEW plug in? And so uh, we're gonna cover a bunch of things and we will have a panel of four brave people up here in a moment. And hopefully, uh, am I having another blonde moment? Oh, turn it on. <laughs> yeah, I need to turn it on. Thank you, Brian. Um, <laughs> so I may get through this uh, session here. Um, we will definitely have a lot of fun in the process. Um, it's on. What? Once, okay. Oh, I wonder, oh, you know what? It's still centered on the software center thing, so. All right, so at a minimum, I can at least, all right, now we're good. I, I actually solved that, uh, yay. So uh, presentation, where are we going with our software stack? And why isn't I going in this direction? Um, what is measurement frameworks? And why do I care? What is gRPC? And why do I care? And of course, um, can I run LabVIEW as a microservice in Docker? Um, there's been a lot of uh, conversations about that, I think, in the Champions Forum. Again, why do I care? Uh, about halfway through, we will have a panel uh, discussion. And, um, but we're going to kick this off. I'm going to set my timer here. So I give me one second. No good grief. Okay, so starting, um, just FYI, don't ask me this question <laughs> during this session. Uh, if we wanna talk about this uh, somewhat contentious topic of uh, LabVIEW uh, subscription model, happy to talk about that later after I've had um, at least a half of an adult beverage. Um, take a picture here. This is actually really important. Um, so we apologize, it was supposed to be uh, Deb Burke was um, going to make it for GDevCon, and she had some family stuff that got in the way, and by then, um, Eric um, Ruffett already had plans going, and so neither one of them were able to be here as kind of the primary LabVIEW R&D representatives. So, um, Brian, who had some good comments on Roadmap, now you, now you have this available, but you know everybody's email anyhow. So, um, big thank you to um, all of the hard work um, by our GDevCon board members. I think I got everybody on there. Um, this was my view when I was walking to work this morning. And so I really want to thank you guys for finding such an awesome venue. Um, and it's just gorgeous here, even though it's a little warm. Um, the problem is there's a lot of really fun stores around and my husband's not going to be happy uh, when I go do shopping um, in between uh, the conference and our evening event. So, but a big thank you to you guys. I work for National Instruments. I love my job. I am not leaving National Instruments and I have a side gig. And for those of you that were at GDevCon last year, I uh, did a presentation on harnessing your creativity. And so my side gig is really about delivering workshops um, and keynotes about harnessing your creativity and getting familiar with doing that on a regular basis. So this is the thing that once I slowly start retiring, then this one kicks in, so I'm still having fun. 
So um, on that note, if you uh, have not seen the TEDx talk on this topic, so you know kind of what I talk about, you can just search YouTube TEDx my name. And here is my disclaimer in case anyone from Legal at NI is watching this. I, uh, Henson LLC does not do lab view coding. We do not do test stand. We do not do system link. We do not do anything, and it's not a we, it's just me, that either competes with NI or any of our partners. So I just want to make sure that's super clear. Um, if you want to know what that image is, it's actually a tree frog. And if you haven't seen my TEDx talk, um, then you'll want to go see the TEDx talk because you want to know why the heck is a frog there. Um, so on that note, um, at NI, I am in the services department. And I'd like to come back to the slide, because I used the slide last year as well, because this is how NI is organized now, in the business units. This is how decision making is done with regards to where does the money go? Where are we going to make our investments? And so some of the things that we're going to look at today were actually funded by the semiconductor business unit. They, there's a lot of money there. And we're going to be able to re-leverage it in transportation, in ADG, and as well in PBU, or portfolio. So, so within services, we mostly support aerospace defense and portfolio. And we do a little bit under semiconductor and transportation. So another thing, another disclaimer. Um, in the services organization, um, NI originally built up the services organization not to compete with partners even though occasionally something goes crosswise. The intent was we had a couple of customers that wanted to go prime with NI and they needed us to stand up offices around the world. And that's how professional services got started. Today, we are still a very, very lean team. We are not trying to grow uh, substantially as a team of professional services. And I think what we'll be seeing very uh, tangibly is better collaboration. Like, there's a variety of things that I'm working on right now, and Ed Dickens can speak to it, that it's like, you know, that goes to DISTEC. Uh, DISTEC is the perfect partner for that. Um, on another project, we're going to be hiring um, Sierra Peaks. Um, uh, and there's so many projects that even professional, uh, professional services, we might kick them off. We might do preliminary work but then the actual execution and implementation should be done by a partner. Um, and, and maybe we do it together. And so I think the dust has settled after our reorganization that that is our motion going forward. There, I know of a couple of incidences in the past where, it, like I said, it got a little bit messy. That is not the norm. And so if you have any questions about that, you can talk to uh, Lyle Shuey, who is the um, consulting partner manager who has a fantastic business plan moving forward. He's waving his hand in the back. And, um, or, or you can talk to me. So quick disclaimer, let's move on to the fun stuff. Um, take a picture. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this um, because I really want to talk about the roadmap of how LabVIEW connects to everything else. So I'm going to talk slowly while you guys grab your pictures. Um, there's information up here on native gRPC. We will hit that. Um, Python, and, and if you look at this, you'll see that from an NI perspective, LabVIEW always has been a first-class citizen. It will continue to be a first-class citizen. And then you'll see Python and C Sharp or .NET really being first-class citizens as well as we move forward. Um, here is the second picture to take for the roadmap. So capture this, ask all of your questions um, at the LabVIEW um, uh, roadmap discussion uh, that I showed earlier. All right. So who was at the CLA Summit 2013 in Austin when Brian Powell did the presentation on stories from the old geezers on the LabVIEW R&D team? Who was there for that? Absolutely hysterical. Um, Brian, you might need to rerun this one again. What was interesting is Brian had several members from the original LabVIEW uh, 1.0 uh, team talking a lot of uh, really fun stories from back in the day. What was striking as well about that is that Laurel Watts pictured up here. Uh, we all know, is Laurel here? I forgot to check to see if she was coming. So Laurel's uh, been at NOAA, software engineer, been in the LabVIEW community uh, 93, 94, something like that since then. And she asked a very profound question. She said to the original group, so we got the original group of LabVIEW developers, there were four that were present, and she asked them, 
So, and she asked, well, she started it with this. She said, when I was programming in LabVIEW 4.0, 4.0, I knew everything there was to know about LabVIEW back in the day. And I think we can all, some of us back in the day, yeah, we, we knew everything about LabVIEW back in the day. So then in 2013, she asked these developers, does anyone at NI know every single aspect about LabVIEW? And the four gentlemen laughed and chuckled. <laughs> because we don't. LabVIEW has gotten, is, it's bigger, it's more complex, and it's very difficult for even one person on the LabVIEW team, even, you know, Lop Loftus Mercer is not on the LabVIEW team anymore at SpaceX, but even someone like Steven or someone like Alan, it's still very difficult as an individual to, um, to really understand absolutely everything there is to know about LabVIEW. And I think there's a good parallel between the applications that we're working on. I mean, the applications that we were all working on, that Laurel was working on back in 94, a lot more simple. And now we're in a world where everything is significantly more complex. And that's just something that has evolved over time. I'm going to stick back here before I go to the next one. Um, so in that complex world, ENI has to grow um, in order to keep our stakeholders happy so that we can still have fun jobs and still work on LabVIEW and all the other things. And as a company, we made a very specific uh, decision to really focus on a key core set of enterprise large companies. Because if we can take one relationship with one semiconductor or aerospace defense company, and maybe they're a two to three million dollar account today or 10, we want to be able to grow that to 50 to 100 million dollars. And in order to grow in that way, we have to elevate what we can deliver from a value perspective to the company and the relationships that we have at the company. We have to be talking about enterprise level value so that we can go to a CTO or a CEO um, at a large company and talk about the entire product life cycle and have tools that enable the development along that life cycle. And doing that means that we have to do more and more things that are gonna be cloud native in the future. And developing an infrastructure that either integrates to what the company has, that's super easy to extend it. And so it was very intentional that NI needed to move to cloud-based solutions and really invest in that area. Now, some of us may joke, yeah, we really should have gotten there about a year or two ago, or maybe three, but we're in a really good position today. And um, I'm gonna mention our CTO in a moment. So this is a Nancy slide that um, I could work on the colors and it could be prettier, but let's talk about a couple pieces on this slide real quickly. And I, I mentioned that this is today, and hey, Brian, how do I, do I just press this to get my little thingy? The laser pointer. Oh, button at the bottom. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs> well, I've been pressing that one. How do I? The other bottom. All right. So I don't have the laser pointer today. But anyhow, um, but let's think about our software stack. Let's look at the left hand side first. So, generally speaking, you can take all the complexity that we build out with LabVIEW, with Test Stand, with Veristand or pure lab view, you got a GUI, you got Alan who's rewriting um, test stand over and over and over again, um, which is actually kind of cool. And don't tell anybody on the test, that, do not tell anyone at NI I just said that. Um, there's aspects of that that are cool. Um, Hal's mouse, and then you have the drivers. And then we have our actual um, instrumentation layer, and that's represented by the green boxes. And then we have our unit under test. So today, and I use the term product analytics specifically because at NI, the group of people that are working on cloud technology are in the quote product analytics team. So this cloud right here is a little bit of a lie today and you know, it's kind of one of those fuzzy things. Um, hexagons, for those of you that are familiar with working in the world of microservices, um, a lot of things are represented by hexagons. You see hexagons in the front of the books and in the books. Um, and that goes back to um, some of the original design patterns going back at, you know, almost 20 years ago. So anytime I show a microservice, you're going to see it as a hexagon, except for the fact that some of these really are just services or service-oriented architectures. Um, and so I, I don't want to confuse that too much, but basically there is stuff in the cloud somewhere. It could be a web service. It could be 
um, some other kind of service, and it can be, of course, our microservices. And sometimes there's some things that we can do for you with System Link, and then sometimes there's things that you're building out on your own, hence Derek is building out his own web server, Brian has a different solution as well. But there's all this cloud stuff. Where we're headed is more and more cloud stuff. And um, I think that's a technical term, cloud stuff, <laughs> or cloud technologies. Uh, there is a technical term called cloud native, um, but the intent here is over time, not just on the aspect of analytics, but the pieces of the stack that were sitting on a tester and sitting on a CPU, over time, we're gonna wanna move some of that to the cloud. So ob the obvious scenario is you got an edge device, you got a digitizer, you grab the data, you push it to the cloud, and you got a hyperscalable cloud solution that allows you to compute um, analytics in a way that you can't do today on a specific server. The other thing is uh, some of the things that are talked about in industry, because um, you know, we're working on projects at large companies and there might be um, an aerospace defense contractor or a semiconductor location or even um, transportation and they have a bunch of testers and the utilization for each hardware stack. So picture I invested $80,000 in this stack of hardware, but it's only being used 20% of the time. So that's a horrible investment. So in a future state, we wanna be able to say, oh, here's a um, specification. From that specification in a cloud-based uh, service, I am then going to derive to the actual test um, strategy and the actual tests that need to be done and the limits and what piece of hardware can actually run that test. And then I can have a floor of test equipment and then I have a cloud solution up here that's, that is distributing different tests to different testers based on what needs to be done. And there's so much else to this, but that is a simple example of one of the things that we see in industry and one of the problems that we do wanna solve. Because if I invested 80K into this piece of hardware, PXI and everything else, I want it to be running 75% of the time or 80% of the time, because 20 is not gonna cut it. So there's a lot of things that are actually sitting on the tester, and by things I mean software components, that we can eventually push into the cloud. And so this is forward thinking like three to five years, and this is a group of forward thinkers. And so we wanna introduce this topic, and when we get to the panel, we're gonna jam on it just a little bit, uh, just a little bit more. So this is the concept. Um, if you wanna go back and look at more information, um, this is actually a screenshot from the NI Connect keynote, and Thomas Benjamin is our uh, chief technology officer and you can go to his session and he's gonna give you some more details. As a side note, let me ask this question. Who came to NI Connect? Was that anything near NI Week? Nope, not at all. That was intentional. And the intent of trying to get the very first post-COVID event going was to make it an event for the larger customers. You know, and so the, the Raytheons and the Qualcomm's and the ADI's and those account managers and keep it really, really small. If we go back and look historically to NI Week, NI Week was composed of two things. It was the account manager that brought everybody from his account to NI Week and they went and had a bunch of closed door meetings and then it was the rest of NI Week that we love dearly, all the technical sessions for us, the developers. And so instead of having one event that is mingling two different um, goals that we wanna achieve and outcomes that we wanna achieve, NI has rolled out NI Connect as our first um, event with the new brand. So don't tell anybody, but I'm asking you guys to go ping and get on NI and go ask people, 
when is NI going to come out with the NI Developers Conference? Just like NI Week. And then we have all of our great technical sessions, and we're going to call it NI Create. So start asking your friends that you know. Ask that question, because I do think, and I cannot um, confirm this 100%, but I do think that that is the intent. NI wants to move towards two different conferences, one focused on our larger um, partners and developing relationships, um, I say partners, companies, customers, and then the other one really focused on us, the developers, because we're going to need this more and more if we're going to go into this space. Yes. Okay, the question is on will that replace the CLA summits? The CLA summit is a completely different thing. Um, happy to have a conversation offline. Um, Eric Ruffett is working on that. There is an open position at NI, and I am not recruiting from anyone in this room, because I don't want anybody to get mad at me, but we have an open position for a developer community manager that would be LabVIEW, Test Stand, and more. And that position has been posted for a while, and that's the person, when that gets filled, we're going to have someone whose job it is to make sure we're doing the right events for developers, which would include you know, some kind of NI week thing and moving back to some kind of a CLA summit. So a lot of us want to see that happen. We need, we need that person in that role to actually make it happen. Um, but great question. So this is where we want to head. We want to head to this place where there is this cloud-based infrastructure and there's all of these things that can happen. And if you go look at um, Thomas's presentation and if you're, uh, if you're familiar with microservices and some of the terminology, He's going to describe a lot of the things up here. And if this is too much, then let's look at it this way. You know, you, know, you have all of these microservices doing different things, built with different pieces and different components. So this is where we want to head, because we want to head to the point where you have a software stack, and then you just deploy a new service to add a feature. You don't have to go re redeploy the whole piece of monolithic code. You just redeploy a feature. Or if something goes wrong, you know exactly where that problem occurred, and then you can spin up another service immediately that captures the state and moves on. So this is the forward-thinking stuff, um, and I see, um, I see a few people are like, okay, I get this, and most everybody's face is like, yeah, I don't get this yet. It, it takes a while to get it, and we'll talk about that more um, when we get to the discussion panel. But um, it's important because as NI is building out this piece of infrastructure, a lot of the technology that we're going to release I don't know if we really call it products or offerings or we just push it out on GitHub, will help support this is also a group of tools that will help us in developing LabVIEW applications that connect to non-LabVIEW uh, infrastructure. So, quick question. How many of you have the luxury of only working in LabVIEW, and that's the only language you ever, ever use. Okay, I expected about that. So, so you guys are the ones, I'm very envious. Um, and then the rest of the hands, how many of you are having to connect to something else? All right, keep those hands up. Is this sometimes a royal pain in the ass? Yeah, I'm seeing some head knobs. Yeah, I guess I'm not supposed to cuss up here, but I just did twice, so. Um, <laughs> So LabVIEW Connected Technologies, we've seen a little bit about the G-Web Development Toolkit and some really good stuff there. Um, there's connectivity to System Link, if you're not aware of that. When I take a uh, sidestep and talk about System Link real quick, System Link, um, as it is shipping today, um, there is a cloud tool that allows you to do some nice GUIs and things, but it's basically a service-oriented architecture, so client-server architecture. Um, I can send data from test stand into system link. All I have to do is turn it on. I can, with LabVIEW, create tags that go into system link. FlexLogger pushes data into system link. And so when I first saw system link come out, I was like, wow, that is a transformational technology because then I, as a LabVIEW consultant, either by myself or with a small firm, we can now start pushing data into this um, cloud technology that provides so much more to my customer. Um, right now, I know NI is doing a lot of the system link stand-ups. Um, there's, there's money in there. There's a lot of money in there if, if you're doing a system link stand-ups. We need more people to do it because we can't get to everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about gRPC. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. 
Um, and we're going to talk about measurement SDK. So um, here's the roadmap. Take a picture of it if you want to. I scratched a bunch of things off of here. But if I look at our entire software stack, System Link and O Plus is the second thing there. Um, that's a really big deal. We're doing automation with um, model-based system engineering. There's some really cool stuff happening there. There's this data studio thing that it's, it's kind of, it's going to eventually be a little bit like requirements gateway, I think. And then, of course, we have measurement frameworks and test stand. So those little dots there are kind of real, um, and I'll, I'll speak to a couple of those. So we're going to spend, because uh, I want to make sure I get the panel up here, and I am going to end up being five minutes late because I started five minutes late, so everyone's forewarned. Um, GRPC, who knows what it is? Who's like, yeah, I've heard of that term, I don't really know what it is. Excellent. All right. You guys are going to hear enough of me up here. Who knows what it is and wants to explain it? And Jeff's got the microphone for you to explain what GRPC is. Does somebody want to explain it? Excellent. Thank you, Jim. All right. I'm not an expert, but um, protobuf is a binary protocol for exchanging data. And I think that GRPC is essentially a set of tools for taking APIs to kind of remote procedures, basically, yeah. uh, and describing them, and then to be able to auto-generate uh, code in different languages yes. for communicating with those services over the protobuf. Well stated. And to dive into this a little bit, the, the value here, um, it is a transportation layer. You're going to build your API. Um, what's unique about gRPC is it's relatively new. Under the hood, it's using HTTP2, so it's going to be really fast. Um, it allows for streaming. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to wrap some APIs around gRPC. But at the first thing that you would take away from this is like, what on earth is this going to buy me? This buys me remote ability. So, Bill, pretend like you're a test rack. Excellent. So, Bill, where are you today? <laughs> I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't expecting questions. Uh, <laughs> I'm in Golden, Colorado. All right, Bill's in Golden, Colorado. I like to scuba dive. I'm in Honduras, and I really don't want to come back because it's just been great. And so, um, I'm going to tell Bill, go install all of your NI drivers. And then I'm going to hang out in Honduras on my laptop and build my test system and run my test system. My laptop does not have any drivers installed on it at all. And so that way I can talk to Bill and make Bill do the things that Bill needs to do. Second thing... My wife wants to talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing I can program Bill to do is let's say... Not only, but the reality is, I don't want to just talk to the instrument drivers. I want to, um, I want to be able to run test stand and run sequences. So then I go make sure that test stand is installed on Bill, and test stand has a gRPC API. So in any language that's supported by gRPC, you know, uh, um, so there's there's um, Python and we're going to put live view wrappers around it, and it's C-sharp, and it's a bunch of other languages. Just uh, grpc.org. You'll go immediately see the list of languages. I'm spacing out on them. So then I, in any language, can sit in Honduras. Um, uh, that would be Roatan Honduras or uh, uh, Guanaja Honduras, and program Bell for test stand. Or let's say um, Alan has built this amazing application, and it's all LabVIEW. And I'm some snotty C-sharp person. I'm like, Alan, you built it all in LabVIEW. I, I can't, what am I supposed to do with your LabVIEW app? Well, then you go install Lab, you go install Alan's app, his actor framework app. So we install the actor framework that Alan built um, on Bill. It's running in LabVIEW. I can then be in C-sharp because there's going to be a gRPC interface so that in any GRP interface language, I can run LabVIEW code. 
I know it's weird when you're like, okay, how does that exactly work? But just know that in any gRPC language, I can run my NI drivers remotely. I don't have to install them on my laptop. I can run, I'm gonna have access to the test stand API. Um, and um, I'm gonna be asking for volunteers uh, to participate in some work groups um, moving forward. And then the third thing is um, I'm gonna be able to run my lab view code. So that right there, the investment in gRPC is really, really powerful. You guys are gonna have the slides so you can kind of see, yeah, sometimes LabVIEW is gonna be the server. Sometimes um, the hardware is the server. And so, you know, I, what, what is it? It really depends on what you're doing. But the important thing is it's connecting LabVIEW to the rest of the world and it's connecting the rest of the world to um, LabVIEW. I'm real excited because I do want to go buy some land somewhere in Honduras or, that, or Ecuador one day. Um, supported languages, supported drivers. Um, if you want to grab your snapshot, I'm not going to spend any time here. But again, you're going to have the slides um, afterwards. Um, it's real important, this test stand, I want to take a minute on it, this test stand API. So now I'm going to be able to call test stand from Python, from JavaScript, or any other language that gRPC supports. And that would be the last slide. But what we're doing is, because gRPC, like Jim said, it is a, it's a methodology that creates the API, and you have a proto file, and then you have to auto-generate, and then you auto-generate code. For these languages, you're not gonna have to auto-generate code, it's just gonna be straight out of the box. Just Google GitHub NI gRPC, and there's a ton of information there. Questions on gRPC before we rapidly move to the next topic? Because I want to make sure we get to some discussion. Um, what movie is this from? I don't even know. Which one? Snakes on a plane. Is it good? <laughs> so I stole this slide. The nice thing is you can plagiarize within your own company. So I stole this from uh, somebody in the measurement frameworks group. So we're going to shift to a completely different topic. And I'm going to try to explain this in a very short period of time before our brave panel gets up here. Um, Instrument Studio. Does anybody know what Instrument Studio is? All right. PXI instruments, out of the box. You can put them together. This is like a cockpit, because I've got a scope, power supply, and a multimeter. So with NI instrumentation, I can put all these things together and, um, and be able to have an interactive front panel, soft front panel, press my buttons, and send a signal, read it, I have my measurement. There is now the ability to, if you see this on the bottom right hand side, to create an Instrument Studio plugin with LabVIEW. Woohoo! We're doing this at a lot of different customers right now, but this is really only the beginning. Why is this important? The workflow we want to move towards is build out your instruments with LabVIEW. It'll be a soft front panel hosted in Instrument Studio, and you test it, and then you're going to be able to run that measurement exactly as is within Test Stand. And that becomes valuable because then you build the measurement one time, you drop it into Instrument Studio, you hand it to the developer, the design engineer, so he can figure out exactly what he wants his measurement to be. And then that measurement gets moved into test stand. Pretty much seamlessly in the future state. Not quite to the future state yet. And that becomes very powerful because then we build out a group of measurements that we test, we reuse, and we're not going back and twiddling with source code over and over and over again. 
I mean, we all, I spend a lot of time in aerospace defense and everybody's reinventing drivers and they're reinventing, oh, I need to do a voltage measurement. How do I do a volt? And they're starting from scratch. Why not just have a voltage measurement um, soft front panel that gets reused over and over and over? And if you know you have to extend it, there's creative ways to extend it. Thank you, solid principles from Uncle Bob. So in this quick video, um, and I'm going to show this video, and I'm going to make sure that you guys have access to it. I'm going to show uh, just a couple quick things, and then we're going to get to uh, our panel. So while I'm showing a couple things, if my pan brave panelists, um, and that would be Brian, Omar, um, Steve, and Quentin. I mean, Derek, thank you. Um, could make their way up here. So right here, you, you will see when I'm building things. Oh, is it playing right now? Oh, there we go. This is how I configure all of my different instruments into my instrument cockpit. So just think like, uh, think it's similar to an airplane. Then I do all my measurements, and then at that point, I am going to save that measurement configuration. So I don't have to build all that. I mean, I could build this, but I don't have to worry about that. It gets saved at a special instrument studio configuration file. Because then when I move into test stand, and I then have loaded my configuration, my instrument studio configuration. Hey, stop. Um, and once I've loaded that configuration, I will be able, future state, okay, I'm having fun. <laughs> so you see the soft front panel right there. So future state will be that that particular pop-up, that soft front panel for my instrument will run while I'm running test stand. I can pause test stand, make changes in my soft front panel. We're gonna, have, we're gonna handle all the instrumentation session management. And so, and then the future state is, I, that soft front panel actually becomes a custom step type in LabVIEW. And so there's a lot of power here for us to be able to deliver and focus on the IP doing the complex measurement that the customer can then leverage. And so, Um, today, we're not all the way there. I, um, Sam will let me know where I can uh, drop this video. It's in my Dropbox, um, so you guys can take a look at it. Know that the video is a video that we took a year ago. It helps you understand where we're going, even if, all, even if it doesn't have all of the features we have available today. Um, measurement frameworks, um, I'm gonna mention, uh, we'll get to it in a moment, but there is an early access program and I'm gonna be looking for a handful of partners um, that wanna be a part of the early access program. There's pieces of this you can get access to today, but we are gonna look for a handful of partners um, to be available. All right, Derek, you've already introduced yourself. Would you like to introduce yourself again? Does anybody forget who I am? <laughs> Hi, I'm Omar Musa, and I work for Virgin Orbit, and I am a test engineering software manager. Hi, everyone. I'm Steven Dusing. I'm a senior project engineer at DMC. And I'm Brian. That's it, Brian? Hi, Brian. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's, as you guys have been watching this, so this is going to be very kind of extemporaneous. Because I just threw a lot of information out there in a very short period of time. The intent is there's all these enterprise solutions that are going to be out there. We want to continue to be using our favorite tool. I wish it could be Alan Smith and not have to use anything else. And we're going to want to be able to connect LabVIEW code to it. So my question for each of you guys, and then, of course, Derek and Brian, you've already talked about it a little bit. Um, so let's start with Stephen and Omar. When have you connected LabVIEW into um, 
and non-LabVIEW infrastructure, and what did that look like for you? So do other NI platforms count as non-LabVIEW? They count, and then give me another non-NI platform, if you've done it. Sure, so I think one easy use case, or one easy example is kind of our current ongoing work with NI on the battery test solution. Mm -hmm. So we've got, in, it really um, reminded me of that slide that you had up of you know having the more cloud-based workflows where your testing operations are all happening more in the cloud, and mm -hmm. you're just using the test uh, stands for the I/O. Um, so you know we're using that gRPC to do the remote calls on test stand, and then in test stand we're really leveraging customer IP that they might have with um, MATLAB code. Python code is is pretty common there, so using a lot of the adapters that Testin already provides and um, that kind of keeps it straightforward for us. Awesome. So I have kind of two use cases also. One of the use cases has been um, leveraging NI system link and just having sort of more or less out of the box, create some custom tags to monitor some test monitoring equipment. So you're monitoring the monitors basically. Um, with relatively small amount of code and getting kind of higher value out of that. The other uh, more, I guess, more interesting and slightly more aligned with the gRPC kind of ideas, uh, we've done some work with um, writing LabVIEW code that connects to MQTT and then takes MQTT as a message broker kind of to send data into data systems uh, such as databases and then dynamically in, in live uh, build up uh, dashboards that are you know in Grafana and other tools like that and what's neat about those infrastructure kind of decisions is that after we've acquired the data and published we basically don't have to write code the rest of it is configuration data running in containers and basically um, base, re relatively cloud native and easy for our DevOps and other teams to support. So could you repeat the what was the message, message protocol again? Um, we've been using MQTT it's Simple MQTT and there's or? MQTT, yeah. yeah. There's a existing open source LabVIEW uh, API for it that um, Francois Normandy um, wrote. That's very, you know, it's very good. And so we've been able to use that and leverage it for a lot of prototype kind of concept systems, and they've been pretty successful. And then, how do you? Or what are you using to build the GUIs? Well, so we're using, in a lot of cases, Grafana, which is like an open source, mm -hmm. or it's not, yeah, I think open source uh, dashboarding system. Um, and what's nice about that is you can just connect directly to MQTT, or you can have the MQTT data push into a database and then connect to the database. And it's effectively like no code configuration based um, dashboarding. Excellent, because I think we were using Grafana under the hood with System Link for a period of time. Yes. <laughs> I think it is incorporated. Uh, I don't know at this point what the current state is. And, but yeah, uh, it wasn't the original dashboarding for System Link, and it went into a phase. And I'm actually not, um, from a configuration management perspective, I'm not on the bleeding edge right now for System Link, so I'm not 100% sure what the dashboarding is using. Excellent. So, um, Derek, based on what we've talked about so far, which what is it you want to go build next in addition to enhancing Derek's web service? Or any comments on what we've covered so far? I'm trying to think, because my role is a lot different now that I'm in technical support and not making stuff other than my own whiling away projects. Um, or how might, yeah. thing, how might this help some of the customers you're supporting? Um, so a lot of it is just the interoperability, more flexibility in what they do. Um, again, I'm, I'm excited about gRPC because um, I'm not just a LabVIEW developer. Um, I've, I've used a bunch of stuff over the years. Um, so it'll be nice to have cleaner integrations once gRPC gets fleshed out more in LabVIEW mm -hmm. um, and getting to use it from anything and, and leverage what's what else already exists in the world. Excellent. Um, so one big takeaway is, what was it, grpc.org. Um, and again, that's open source, and it's an update to RPC going back in the day. There's 
Um, plenty of inf interesting information to read about it. And I lose track of what we've released. And like, I had to like pull stuff off that roadmap because I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to, what I can talk about and not talk about. So I'm going to err on uh, uh, being conservative. But again, I'm looking forward to next year at GDEVCON uh, to hear what some of uh, you guys, what you've been able to build. So I'm going to ask Brian the fun question. So Brian, we were chatting the other night and I was extolling the myriad virtues of microservices, of which there are many. And at the same time, developing microservices and building on a microservice architecture is not something you enter into lightly. So what's your opinion on, do you care about microservices or are web services sufficient for your customers? Or, because I want you to put your skeptics hat on based on everything you've seen up here on for your customers, when does it make sense to leverage gRPC? When would microservices maybe make sense in the future? Um, so, so, you know, my, my background on this, you know, I mentioned that giant 11 million line Perl program is an example of a monolith to the extreme, you know, it's even five products in one. So, you know, so one of the things that we were working on, uh, which was a really good idea, but the leader of it didn't really know how to execute was to try to decompose that into uh, a whole bunch of services and have a microservice architecture. And uh, there's a lot about that that makes sense, um, but especially when you're kind of moving from this more monolithic thing, is you want to kind of pick and choose what are, where do you use microservices? And the idea of a microservice is it's a, a single service in the system, and it just does that one thing, but it does it as you know, as well as you can do it. Um, so for example, we had uh, an identity and access provider that was a microservice. And its job was basically figure out that somebody can log in and once they log in, what do they have access to? That's all it does, is just identity, identity and access provider. Um, the, one of the ways that we failed at this conversion from a monolith to microservice architecture is well, we picked off 30 different things to work on at once and make 30 different microservices and then try to put those 30 different microservices back together again to do something meaningful. And when you're decomposing a large monolith, you really need about 500 microservices to, uh, to do that. And you know, we didn't have 500 different teams to really build these microservices. So, so you know, I think the microservice uh, uh, bandwagon was really maybe started about five, six years ago is when everybody was big and, and heavy on that. And then the pendulum has kind of swung back to there should be a mixture of services and microservices. And I think especially in our case of trying to decompose a monolith is, you know, figure out how to introduce like one or two microservices into the system. And eventually you can kill off part of your monolith and you can start to chip away at it. And so that's where I think the, the uh, industry is today, the web industry more so than NI's industry of, you know, yeah, there's a place for some microservices, but it do, you don't have to really have an entire microservice-based architecture. One of the other things about microservices, the idea is that they really have no state on their own. Um, so that, you know, you, you really, you know, the identity and access provider, whatever state it has is internal to the identity and access provider. There's nothing that comes from the outside so much that it, it doesn't have to depend on an external database that you're also talking to. Um, and so that's where you start to, you know, well, I really have to decompose my problem in a different way in order to make it fit into microservices. And I think that that's, um, you know, one of the things that I think NI has to figure out is like, where does, where does, is it really a microservice? Should it be a service? Is there, is there, how do I introduce that into all the existing applications that NI customers are already trying to build or already have built? And then now you're introducing this new concept. So I'm not sure how that's all gonna play out. Awesome, so I want everybody out here to be thinking about some questions um, and make a comment and then offer a question. Um, so I've seen one of the internal documents that breaks everything down and it really makes my brain hurt. 
Um, and so there are oodles of oodles of hopefully the right people working on that. And where does the microservice fit? Where is there going to be a service? What's orchestrating what? Does the microservice own its data? Or is there going to be a time where it's going to access other data? Yeah, I'm glad I don't have to figure that out. Omar. I just want to say, like, from my perspective, like, the G especially the gRPC-related development that I was working on is really important for our kind of organization because we have very large, a very large software team across multiple languages and different departments. And so one of the challenges we have currently is finding ways to make sure our stuff is interoperable, especially if it's LabVIEW based. And so the gRPC kind of investment enables that in a big way for us for the future. And we're, we're very excited about that. I always have a question in my back pocket. Are there questions out here? Are we at the point where we, we're not even sure what to ask yet? Yes, um, Matthew. Phone. I guess my question kind of goes back to what you were talking about migrating things from systems to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of work in aerospace industry and with the government. And I just keep imagining that if I were to propose to someone there, hey, I'd like to move some of this service that's on this system to the cloud, they would absolutely lose their minds over security concerns. And I'm just surprised that you see the move to the cloud as being driven by these large you know, corporate and governmental entities. Um, maybe you can just fill me in, what am I missing? So I will let you guys answer first, since you're my panel. Uh, the cloud doesn't mean an NI-owned server. Uh, it just means not the PC of the person using the service, basically. Uh, you can have an on-site hosted cloud that's just using the same implementation as what we're building our software as a service uh, platforms with. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I mean, to your point, I was on site uh, last week at a defense um, organization and even something, even something like that where, hey, you can set up an in internal server, even that was like gonna be a lot of pain to get set up. So. Um, we do serve a lot of customers across different markets. So as far as like transportation goes, we're absolutely kind of noticing this field. There, there's a big need for having that centralized data to be able to use it at the same time. I also, like we do have customers that honestly, we're not really pushing this type of framework just because it's, it's moving mountains to get it uh, up for them. So I, I see both sides of it really. Oh, actually. I'll just say really quickly, um, there are definitely different levels of those government customers, and I, I recognize that. Um, there is also a growing area on top of hosted services internally. There's also gov clouds and things of that nature that handle various degrees of the security. And of course, there's areas where that becomes still a no-go. But it does allow for some areas that were previously a no-go area to become partially or fully accessible. And I'll just add, a lot of it is moving to technologies and platforms that are more IT friendly for deploying internally or externally, um, being able to deploy to AWS, Gov Clouds, uh, different platforms. Um, so it's, it's cloud as the technology platform, not necessarily where it is. I'll make two quick comments. Um, within the realm of private cloud, we had a customer that came to us an aerospace defense, uh, aerospace defense company, you'll, you'll know their name once the auto test con paper is published. And they came to us with the exact architecture that Thomas Benjamin had at the NI keynote. And their data center's on site, and it is, if you're not cleared, it's really not easy to even get your car on site. Um, and so they are recognizing that they have to move to that uh, solution, at least at that location. There's also stuff that I know nothing about that's DOD and it's around quality assurance with microelectronics and making sure that we can, we have an end-to-end cloud-based way to model and develop microelectronics in a very secure way. So there's a lot of people actually in DOD trying to figure out all this stuff and there's just too much stuff to know. It's too complex. But both sides, you guys got both sides. Some comp uh, defense companies are ready and some are not. One more question. So I'm going to ask an elephant in the room question. Um, what about resources that NI is devoting to all of this? I can't install LabVIEW on Windows 11 without errors. And it doesn't work on Mac. 
I get mad every time I see the logo for Mac OS with LabVIEW. That and is a I, great elephant. These are Eric questions. I see yeah. the roadmap, but Windows 11 has been out nine months. This is like me giving my wife a tour of the new section of the house I'm remodeling, and she's pointing me back to the plumbing that's not working in you know the old bathroom. We depend on LabVIEW. And, and I hear through this discussion, you have me on G GRPC, I am sold. But my life depends on LabVIEW. Mm -hmm. What is the resource ratio? Because it's always, and you can do this on LabVIEW. But LabVIEW isn't working. So, and this will be a, a conversation that when you get a chance to talk to Lyle, I know Lyle will want to hear this as well. I can convey this as well. I have no idea what the distribution of resources is. I hear you, and we need to continue the conversation, um, and I'm, I'm trying to be an, an enabler to help that, but I don't have an immediate answer, but I'm glad you asked the elephant in the room. Sure. So I'm an outsider, don't work at NI, but I worked there for 26 years, so I kind of know how NI works. And so um, I'm actually optimistic you know, say killed off NXG last year, which I was a huge fan of killing off NXG. I was, I, I was asking for that from 2005 when they started the project. Um, NI has to figure out now, what do I do with all those people who are working on NXG and, and our recommitment to uh, LabVIEW current gen? And notice I just said our commitment to LabVIEW current gen, which some of it is just me being former NI, but also I think we all have this commitment to LabVIEW current gen. NI spent 15 years and a billion dollars working on NXG, it's going to take a while for them to figure out how do I shift the energy of, of the company away from that. And they're not just shifting it all back to LabVIEW Current Gen, they're shifting it to these other projects and things like that. They're shifting it to working with other languages. So it's going to take a while for NI to figure out how to operate in a new mode. And it's going to take more than a year, it turns out. You know, I think it's probably going to take several years for them to figure that out. But I think part of it is, you know, like, you know, we talk about moving things like Unicode back to current gen. We talk about thing, moving um, Zoom back to current gen. All those things are things that can happen, but they have to happen thoughtfully. And you have to figure out how do I fit that into a product planning process and so on. And frankly, it's not something NI knows how to do easily. And so NI is having to figure those sorts of things out. So I think. Basically, I think it's you need patience. We need patience to give NI a chance to prove itself. And I'm not convinced that NI is going to deliver on that, but I'm hopeful that NI is going to deliver on that. I'm going to make one comment on that, and then I'm going to close this out, and then we'll have more discussion later. So, Jason, follow up with me because as Brian was talking, I remember a slide that I looked through in our official corporate slide deck that specifically calls out LabVIEW. And so, I, and so, you know, I want to ask some of those questions. And Brian's right. There is a lot of intentionality, even if we're not getting things out fast enough, to continue to move LabVIEW current gen, or LabVIEW that we love, forward. I am very optimistic we will continue to do that. But I want to ask some of the tough questions. Um, that being said, some of the technologies from that LabVIEW NXG kind of thing actually helped R&D learn in a way that they can move some things forward in current gen a little bit better. And some of that went into Instrument Studio. We did not get the ROI for the billion dollar investment. That's for darn sure. So I want to thank everybody here. But before we, before we head out, real quickly, and heck, I'm, I'm late. Sorry, guys. Um, if you are interested in GRPC API for Test Stand, think about this. Let me know. Carlos Gonzalez is leading the team at NI, and he wants to work with customers who would be early adopters. The actual API should drop in about two months, more or less, and it will be a beta version of the API. Carlos is fantastic to work with. As I mentioned earlier, I need a very small group of um, probably a couple of integration partners, probably a couple of consulting partners, um, and you guys will collectively be a company that is going to, will put through the early access program for measurement SDK. And so to do that, um, you know, there's a couple of parameters about you know, what we really need in you as a consulting partner and an integration partner. Reach out to me, we can talk offline. Uh, John Bongartz um, uh, gave the green light for that. 
And then the question we never answered is Omar's question from um, the LabVIEW Champions meeting. How do I run LabVIEW as a microservice hosted in Docker? Um, there's some interesting technologies. You know, eventually we're going to have this all figured out. Um, and I don't know what stuff releases and drops when, but there may be some interesting ways that we can do that sooner than later. So Omar, you are the official point of contact on running LabVIEW hosted um, in Docker as a microservice. Um, and if you want to pass that off to somebody else, please do. Um, but if you are interested in that, um, talk to Omar or talk to me, either one. And I apologize for going over. Thank you all for your questions. A lot of this stuff that feels confusing and nebulous, um, it will be more clear over time. So thank you.